So I'm Pedro. Um, I work remotely for a small startup in London. It's called Speckle. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about unreliable narrators and legacy code, which is a brilliant title because you probably have no idea where I'm going with this, and I could go anywhere. So that's pretty cool. Hopefully, this will make sense <laughs> at some point. Um, what I would like you to take away from the presentation would be uh, a new approach, or be more aware of an approach I'm, cer I'm certain you already have, of reading code, specifically legacy code. So could we have like a show of hands um, for people that have worked on apps with code bases that are like older than three years? Roundish? Yes, all of us, because <laughs> rescue missions, yeah, they're a thing, they happen. Um, so out of all of those people, how many of you like know the development team that came before you or are acquainted with them and work continuously? Okay, that's about half the room. Cool. Um, so I really like working in legacy code, which might sound weird, <laughs> but I think there is something amazing to an, a code base that's been running for many years into production and has all of these voices in them and styles and knowledge and history. Um, I think the person that said it best was uh, Sarah May on the Bike Shed podcast, uh, which you should probably listen to. Uh, not paying like uh, lip service to Sean or anything. This was not arranged. This is for real. Um, and I think the quote says it all. An older code base, you can see the battle scars. You can see where people fought over decisions, try to figure out the trade-offs. And there's a lot of knowledge to be gained from that, to actually realize um, how it came to be that way. When we qualify a code base as um, legacy, uh, there are certain traits to it, let's call it that, that uh, you kind of expect. You probably have like low test coverage. Um, the domain is immense, and you're not, and you have like certain difficulties approaching it. Um, so most of us would probably go through, open the routes file maybe, have a look at that, try to figure out what it does. Then maybe we would open up the models folder and maybe go out for a coffee, settle down, breathe in a bit. Then when we were feeling like more or less brave, we would probably open the two to three god models that exist in the application and start on our merry way to figuring out how am I going to approach this? How am I going to do work on this code base that is very hard for me to grasp or understand? So um, most of the examples, not most, all of the examples I have in this um, presentation uh, come from a single application that I ran some stats for using this neat little command which gave us a grand total of 102 different authors over a period of seven years, which is massive. Um, the thinking on doing Rails over the last seven years has changed incredibly. And has it got dragged kicking and screaming, it turns out, <laughs> across all of these years? There is definitely a lot of stuff that is interesting, but there is also the point at which it's nearly impossible to do work on it, because you just do not know what it does anymore <laughs> in a lot of places. So um, to give you just the sort of example of what happens um, when you try to approach a code base like this, is usually you start poking around the code, like I said, and you might come up to a controller. You came from the routes file and say, oh, this is probably like the main thing. So I'm going to go in there. And then you get this. 
And you start reading it, and goes, okay, so people are quite paranoid about approvals. Um, they're doing some weird stuff with params. Okay, fair enough.、Uh, it's pretty old by now. So, and you land up on the first branch of logic that you have there, which already like kind of makes you like shrivel up a bit because like say with weak validations, why exactly?、Um, but anyway, it was a thing, and there are many apps out there that have that. And then you follow through the stack trace, go into the model. Adequate response,、um, and you read the method. <laughs> and you think, well, <laughs> evidently somebody was really paranoid about the approval bit over in the controller action, and then they kind of like did it for nothing, <laughs> really. So what happened here? So and then it's the bit where the history starts to come along. Because we tend to inherently assume、um, a single voice talking back to us, we tend to assume that somebody wrote through the entire thing, and digging through Git history, they didn't. The, the save with weak validations method already existed, but somebody, probably、um, handling all of the pressures that these code bases tend to produce upon you. Uh, wrote the controller action, and was really afraid of everything that could go wrong with approvals. And the main issue that that this begins and starts to escalate is that we basically start lacking trust. We don't trust the voice. We don't trust whatever is on the other side,、um, so to speak. We do not trust the narrator. We do not trust the person that is telling us the story, and we start to think. So, if if something that simple could be broken, could break the implicit pact that we all have that we wrote something that he that is、um, hand handable to somebody else, you you might start to get very paranoid and have a very hard time、um, continuing to do your work. And especially, you go into the mindset that like these people didn't know what they were doing, and I need to save all of it, and it probably isn't true.、Um, so that's like my definition and initial example of legacy codebase. So let's start to introduce the excuse me. Let's start to introduce the unreliable narrators. Does has anybody ever heard the expression? Good. We have three, four people. That's interesting. It's more than I expected, really.、Um, so I'll give you the standard、um, Wikipedia definition, which is what everybody giving a presentation should do. Just go to Wikipedia, come up with the <laughs> definition of the thing. So an unreliable narrator is one who tells lies, conceals information, misjudges with respect to the narrative audience. That is one whose statements are untrue, not by standards of the real world or of the authorial audience, but by the standards of his own narrative audience. So, this definition touches upon three types of audience and a narrator.、Um, there's a useful distinction to be had in which the the,、uh, the authorial audience is the hypothetical audience、uh, to whom the author addresses the text. So usually, when you write, you write towards、uh, an audience of readers that are hypothetical because you don't know them. And there, there's the narrative audience, which is the audience of the narrator of the text itself,、um, which is different from the author. So, for instance, in a book, you might have、um, a narrator telling a story to somebody, which is not the reader; it's an,、um, an audience that exists within the text. Um, and the funny thing about equating this to development is that we, as the next developer, start to get、um, to cross the boundaries of these audiences, because we also start producing parts of the narrative. We, we also contribute code, and we keep augmenting the narrative and going forward with it. 
So that lands us in, um, in a peculiar situation. Um, I think this might be better illustrated by some examples of unreliable narrators that I'm sure you're probably familiar with. So let's start with these guys. This is kind of dark. Can you all identify the film from which this is taken? I'm sorry, it's quite dark. I didn't expect that. Fight Club. Okay. So this is a very unreliable pair of narrators in that like, one doesn't actually exist. Uh, also, they're drinking beer, which, you know, can get tricky when you're dealing with legacy code and along the way. So why is this an unreliable narrator when you watch the film? It's the fact that it totally obliterates, by the end, um, your perception of the world you had just witnessed. So maybe to try to put this into a more concrete fashion, I have picked up some samples of code to compare, to compare with um, these types of narrators. Um, so here we have one of the God objects, and we have an amazing bit of common. <laughs> so this is actually the, the, the first spot where I landed when working on this application. And I could no longer trust the world around me a single bit. Um, everything was shattered. So, and working on, on code with that frame of mind is awful. I intensely dislike doing it. I don't like um, not giving people a chance to be correct. They might know much better than me. But at this point in time, like, I'm lost. I have nothing. I, I believe nothing whatsoever um, in this code base. Um, which then gets further exacerbated by stuff like this. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Um, that's beautiful comment design. Almost as if the actual code was written for somebody to write those two bits of comment there. <laughs> and this is the point at which you have to think, and you count the number of words in the comments, and you kind of think that, I mean, it, doesn't, it isn't that hard. You use sort of the same amount of words and make something that is correct and reveals intent. Um, so one of the things that I, I don't want to give the impression is that I am bashing a programmer or several programmers, as it is the case. Like, there was a reason why people couldn't do the right thing or were led to think that this was their way out. I'm just going to comment on this. Um, this one is fine, I guess, to a degree. Um, leaving an, an infinite loop in, not so much. Um, but anyway, we need to start thinking, thinking about, like, this person is sort of manipulating stuff. He's not, I can't get the full history of why he made this decision. I can't get the idea of a trade-off here. Probably because there isn't one. Granted, it's a pretty bad one. But um, something got lost. Something gets lost when you deal with this. And then we have another type of unreliable narrator, which is my favorite one. Um, I'll go so far as to say this is probably the world's favorite unreliable narrator. And while he, uh, Forrest Gump has a narrator is like insanely unreliable because while watching the film, we have the notion that there is no contact between cause and consequence of what we're seeing and the story that we're being told. So imagine you didn't actually have the film and you just read the narration from Forrest Gump. You would have like a very different thing in your mind. However, this is my favorite type of unreliable narrator because it's the one that tries a lot to do the right thing. He might, he might fail, and he might break trust, 
but he deeply tries to do the right thing and says the good um, in everything he's doing. That being said, this is a fairly long thing, so I'll try to take you bit by bit through um, some of the digging I did, which started here, and what looks like a slightly trivial piece of code is something that is insanely dangerous, because you might use it for control flow. And it turns out that nil to i um, is not nil, it's zero. So then, this whole branch of code doesn't get executed, period. And you, you're trying to implement a feature that like, redoes payments, and the VAT profiles never actually ran correctly. But somebody was actually trying to do the right thing. Um, and I say that because of this. So, this person did this in a bunch of places. And when you think about it, he was absolutely trying to make sure that Active Record didn't get a string. Which is wrong, because <laughs> it's supposed to get strings. That's how it works. Um, but anyway, there was a, like, a very concrete effort to protect people from something. And to make it explicit in the code, I am concerned about this. I am trying to protect you. I am trying to tell you that there was a problem here at some point. I am trying to make your life better. But still, with the knowledge you have, you will, you will not trust this. You will, you, it's again the voice that gets scratched, that breaks trust. Where else did this like, weird casting take place? Did they monkey patch stuff <laughs> so that Active Record will always get an integer for IDs. You don't know. And in a code base with that size, you're not going to find out anytime soon until it blows up in your face, as it always does. <clears throat> the following example, um, I had a hard time placing this one. Um, because of that variable, like magic number 13, and somebody called, assigned the name of a variable to magic numbers, so they knew, they absolutely knew, I am kind of doing the wrong thing here. I am coming up with a magic number. Um, and then that whole stuffing of chains and stuff like that just tests that a magic number is indeed magic and will be returned. Uh, but again, um, it's strange enough that you come across this, and you actually think, what was this person trying to say by, by acknowledging that I am introducing like a, a code spell, a testing code spell that is perfectly catalog and everybody knows about, but they still decided to use the name. And this one I can't actually figure out why, because there are very few commits uh, of that author in the code, so I could not quite analyze it enough to understand what the history was, or what the narrative of that voice in the code base was. Um, then there's another type of, the final one, I promise, this is the final type of unreliable narrator, which is not even a narrator, uh, so to speak. Uh, I am a huge fan of David Lynch films, and that's basically an unreliable world. You, you watch a David Lynch film, and by the time you're done, your perception of fundamental notions of the universe gets thrown out the window. So space and time no longer mean a thing. And you can't make any sense of it, because you can't stop about thinking of your perception of space and time. So this guy is like the ultimate example. I don't know if uh, you're familiar with Lost Highway, but uh, there's a party scene, and this person is telling one of the main characters, like, oh, I'm at your house. Uh, please call me at your house. And the guy answers in the house, and you go, okay. That was interesting. <laughs> um, which is basically represented by this. 
I'll let you take that in for a bit. So that's a test. Has no assertion. Creates a hundred users. Clicks a link, and increments a hash in a key that only exists in this test scenario. And there's a to do. It's probably not the right to do, though. It should, it should be slightly different. So this is the category I assigned this one to. I really couldn't do any better.、Um, so I've been talking a lot about history and digging through history, and、um, our tool, usually to do that, is Git Blind. We, as a community, tend to dispute the name. Of the tool, and I absolutely agree.、Um, but it does have its purposes. The main issue with dealing with unreliable narrators and this kind of lack of trust is that、um, this is basically the common status where you're at before typing Git blame, and this is where you end up after doing Git blame, and it's not entirely useful. If we just keep getting frustrated and frustrated and frustrated, so all of this talk about literary theory and narrators and audiences、um, has led me to think about using Git blame in these explorations in a slightly different manner. Which is this: we call upon the author to explain,、um, and this is. Sort of my way of thinking, like I can, I cannot go into the mindset of thinking that people were idiots. I cannot go into the mindset of thinking people were wrong and I know better. I need to understand the narrative of the code.、Um, it was actually a funny story working in this application, whereby I landed on a very weird piece of code that dynamically defined a bunch of methods.、Um, And immediately went into the mode. Oh God, not meta programming again. Why? And I git blamed it, and it landed on one of my personal heroes. And that was odd, because all of my expectations about what was I was reading immediately changed. And it was through that that I started thinking, why would you do that? Why would such a smart programmer do such a weird thing? And eventually, I got the chance and the opportunity to、um, speak to people related to that project. And he was pulled, pulled through, pulled out of the project. The entire team did、uh, overnight. So that was actually a step in a refactoring. He was just moving, <laughs> hurriedly trying to extract methods, move them, and then probably implement a strategy pattern. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, that was kind of like the idea I got. But if that name would have been different, I would just have prescribed it to one of the weird ways of writing code that was riddling the application. So, my proposal、um, to start handling the problem is one that we're all quite familiar with. We all know it. We all defend it. We all try to do the best we can with it. So. Your tests are the traveler's guide to the galaxy for whoever comes next. That's the only place where where you can create a world and explain it in terms you control, and are not contaminated by crafts of years and complications. So communicate liberally in your tests.、Um, avoid. The insistence of dry.、Um, it's fine if you do、uh, a test with the four、um, stages, like X unit stages of setup, exercise, verification, and then teardown. It's fine if you repeat the setup. If the setup leads you to think or leads to communication about the world you are handling, it's fine. Don't try to abstract it into Uh, using tools like lights sometimes, and I'm sorry, Sam, about that one. Just 
bleds are fine, but they can be overused like many things.、Um, if there is not an abstraction of the of, of the setup that is meaningful or will communicate something to guide the next、uh, developer through the code, just don't do it. You haven't found it, probably. So, in brief,、um, reading code is an activity that we should all engage in, and I see no reason that we shouldn't consider it、um, as much of a craft as it is actually writing code. And there's an entire body of information、uh, that comes from literary theory and language analysis. That we should employ, and that will probably make us like stronger as a community, and we can improve、um, and ease、um, the onboarding of a developer into like a big legacy app or a rescue mission. We should be like very reliable narrators, and try to communicate as best as we can, leave a cohesive narrative for the next person, and try to create. That sort of trust and empathy that will improve the code and will make everybody's life easier and better.、Um, I guess that's it. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs>